Hello again, 102. In this video, we will go over the second new deal here defined for you, and we will also discuss some of the other accomplishments of this time period and begin to explore how the new deal evolved and how it transformed the role of the federal government. This helped to lay the foundation of a federal social welfare system through the creation of Social Security. Roosevelt explained that he's fighting communism, Huey Longism, Coughlinism, Townsendism in early 1935. He explained he must fight even harder to save our system, the capitalist system, from such crackpot ideas. And in the first three months of 1935, dubbed the Second Hundred Days, Roosevelt used all his considerable political skills to convince the Democratic-controlled Congress to pass most of the Second New Deal's must legislation. And the results changed the face of American life. The Works Progress Administration defined this was an agency that managed many federal job programs, and they became the largest employer in the nation. They built LaGuardia Airport, they restored the St. Louis waterfront, and they managed the bankrupt city of Key West, Florida. The Works Progress Administration also employed a wide range of talented writers, artists, actors, and musicians in new cultural programs like the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Art Project, which allowed a lot of artists to paint murals on the walls of many post offices around the country. And if any of those are still in existence, they're priceless. The Federal Music Project and the Federal Writers Project. And 27-year-old Lyndon Baines Johnson directed a National Youth Administration program in Texas, and Richard Milhouse Nixon, a struggling Duke University law student, found work through the NYA at 35 cents an hour. And these two gentlemen will remember that. The Wagner Act, the Magna Carta of Labor, the National Labor Relations Act, also called the Wagner Act in honor of the New York Senator Robert Wagner, who drafted it and convinced Roosevelt to support it. The Wagner Act was one of the most important pieces of labor legislation in history, guaranteeing workers the right to organize unions and bargain directly or collectively with management about wages and other issues. It also prohibited employers from interfering with union activities. The Wagner Act created a National Labor Relations Board to oversee union activities across the nation, NLRB. And there is Wagner Act defined. Again, it guaranteed the right to organize, to directly bargain, and it barred employees from interfering with union activities. And now the landmark piece of legislation, Social Security. Federal assistance to retired workers through tax-funded pension payments and benefit payments to the unemployed and disabled. Old age survivors and disability insurance was the actual bill. Roosevelt came to believe that this was the supreme achievement of the New Deal. And the basic concept of government assistance to the elderly was not new. Many countries had already enacted such programs, but not the United States. And here was a poster issued by the federal government that sought to educate the public about what you can do after age 65. And this is well worth a look. Nice piece of information and how you can get your monthly check. The Social Security Act was designed by Secretary of Labor Frances Perkin, the first woman cabinet member in history, and it included three major provisions. Its centerpiece was a self-financed federal retirement fund for people over 65. Beginning in 1937, workers and employers contributed payroll taxes to establish the fund. Most of the collected taxes went toward pension payments to retirees. The rest went into a trust fund for the future. Roosevelt stressed that Social Security would not guarantee everyone a comfortable retirement. Rather, it would supplement other sources of income and protect the elderly from some of the hazards of life, like eating out of garbage cans left out behind restaurants, as we saw earlier. 
Only during the 1950s did voters and politicians come to view Social Security as the primary source of retirement income for working class Americans. And unfortunately, many people still view it that way. And it's not going to be enough. The Social Security Act also set up a shared federal state unemployment insurance program financed by a payroll tax paid by employers. In addition, the new legislation committed the national government to a broad range of social welfare activities based upon the assumption that unemployables, people who were unable to work, would remain a state responsibility, while the national government would provide work relief for the able body. To that end, the Social Security Act provided federal funding for three state-administered programs, old age assistance, aid to dependent children, and aid for the blind, and further aid for maternal, child welfare, and public health services, the modern social welfare state. The Social Security payroll tax was regressive because it used a single withholding rate, the same rate for everyone, that's what makes it regressive, regardless of income level. In addition, the Social Security system, at the insistence of Southern Democrats, determined to maintain white supremacy in the region, excluded 9.5 million workers who most needed the new program, farm laborers, domestic workers, and the self-employed. That will later be changed, a disproportionate percentage of whom were African Americans. Another major bill making up the second phase of the New Deal was the Revenue Act, sometimes called the Soak the Rich Tax. This Revenue Act raised tax rates on annual incomes greater than $50,000, in part because of stories that many wealthy Americans were not paying any taxes. The powerful banker J.P. Morgan confessed to a Senate committee that he had created fictitious sales of stock to his wife that enabled him to pay no taxes. Those guys are smart. The New Deal helped to revive the labor union movement. John L. John L. Lewis, excuse me, the head of the United Mine Workers, was among the first to capitalize upon the pro-union spirit of the National Industrial Recovery Act. He rebuilt UMW from 150,000 to half a million members within a year. And in 1935, with the passage of the Wagner Act, Industrial unionists formed a Committee for Industrial Organization. And craft unionists, or skilled workers, what we talked about with Samuel Gompers and the AFL, they began to fear submergence by mass unions, or industry-wide unions, made up of mainly unskilled workers. And the disputes divided them. And in 1936, the AFL expelled the Committee of Industrial unions, which then reformed a permanent structure called after 1938 the Congress of Industrial Organizations, also known by CIO. And the rivalry spurred both groups to recruit more members. They will be reunited again in the 1950s. Sit-down strikes became a tactic of mass unions. And the CIO's major organizing drives in the automobile and steel industries began in 1936, but until the Supreme Court upheld the Wagner Act in 1937 in NLRB v. Jones and Laughlin Steel Company, a landmark case, companies would not cooperate with its pro-union provisions. And there are violent encounters between labor and management forces. There's a good picture of that in the text. Early in 1937, led by a fiery young union organizer by the name of Walter Ruther, thousands of employees at the General Motors assembly plants in Flint, Michigan, occupied the factories and stopped all production. Female workers supported their male counterparts by picketing at plant entrances. Company officials called in police to harass the strikers, sent spies to union meetings, and threatened to fire the workers and FDR refused to step in in this situation. He was not happy with the union tactic of the sit-down strike, which will later be outlawed, but he also did not get involved in the dispute. And that leads into Roosevelt's second term, and we will discuss that in the next part.